Well, as we uh, begin this morning, we are in our last week of our Parenthood series this morning. So uh, I just want to thank you for kind of walking this journey with us as we uh, have just in- investigated what is parenthood all about? What does it mean to be responsible for the next generation of Christ followers? And it is a tall task. It's not an easy one. Uh, there is incredible joy in it. And there's beauty in it. There is struggle in it and beauty in that struggle, of course. Uh, <clears throat> today, as we, as we wrap up, we're going we're gonna to finish with kind of a tough one. Uh, parenthood, as I have mentioned, is filled with all kinds of beautiful joys and blessings. But there are moments in, parent, in being a parent where, uh, where, where we wonder if, if we've just failed miserably all the way through. It, it's amazing how one moment or one situation uh, can so rattle our confidence uh, as, as moms and dads. Today we're going to look at a story that I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It is a uh, famous one of the prodigal son. Maybe the most famous parent-child story in all of Scripture. Most of the time when we work through this passage, or probably I would, I would guess most of the times you've heard messages on this passage, the focus has been on the prodigal, on, on the child who left. Today, what I'd like for us to do is to, to practice focusing on another character in the story, on the father himself. As parents, uh, it is not all smooth sailing, and we need to be prepared and understand how ought we respond when we face rejection as parents. And it happens to all of us. This story comes, uh, just for a little context, this parable that Jesus is telling comes in a, a triplet. Jesus is uh, speaking to large crowds of people. In fact, if you have your Bibles and you want to, would like to follow along, we'll be in Luke chapter 15 today. But at the end of chapter 14 in uh, verse uh, 25, it says that large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said. So th- this, is, this is a large crowd, and this large crowd has been kind of following Jesus. This is moving into kind of the, the heart of his ministry. He's gained incredible popularity, lots and lots of people uh, coming to hear Jesus teach, to see the miracles, uh, to, to find out what this guy is all about. So there are large crowds, and verse or chapter 15 starts off by saying, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So not only is this a large crowd, but it's a crowd that that for those standing around, they have started to take notice that some of the people in the crowd don't quite fit. They're not... They're not the type of people that we would want to hang around with, that we would want to be associated with. And, and it's pointed out right here in verse 15. The tax collectors, the, those who are of the same, uh, the same grouping as we are, right? These are Jewish people that now work for the Roman government. They're seen as, as traitors, as sellouts to the Romans. And sinners, people with history, maybe very public history. We've seen Jesus associate with some of these individuals one-on-one throughout his ministry. Now in this large crowd, many of them have have given to following him, if not full-time, close to it. And so now there are enough of them in the crowd that that there are those that kind of look around and go, wow, uh, this is an interesting group of people gathered to hear Jesus. The tax collectors and the sinners had, were gathering around to hear Jesus. Verse 2, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. You, you can kind of just hear them murmuring, right? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Not only does he tolerate them in the crowd, I mean, this is a public space, so maybe they come to hear Jesus, maybe he sees them, maybe he doesn't in the crowd. Like, we're way past all of that. 
those who are respectable spiritual leaders in the, in the culture are looking at the crowd and going, he's not just tolerating these folks that have come to, to gather with the crowds, but, but he actually, actually spends time with them outside of these large public gatherings. He eats with them. He spends time with them. And, and they're all muttering to themselves, not just that it's happened, but they, they begin to have opinions of Jesus based on that. So in this, in this context, Jesus then tells, he sees the crowd, he sees the, the cast-offs, right, the sinners and the tax collectors that are in the crowd, but he also sees, he sees the spiritual leaders, those respected, those who have influence in the society. He sees them kind of whispering to themselves and muttering to themselves about what's going on. He's heard enough from them. He knows, he knows where he stands with them. And so this is all going on. And Jesus, in that moment, decides to tell three stories about the kingdom of heaven and the response from God when someone who is far away from God comes near to God. And so he tells three parables. They're very short, very brief. The first one is about a lost sheep that the shepherd, as you know, leaves the 99 to go find the lost sheep. And then he tells a parable about a lost coin, a woman who loses a valuable coin in her home and she tears the place apart in order to find this lost coin. And then he finishes with this third parable about, about a, a father and his two sons. It, it is the longest of the three. It is definitely the most detailed of the three uh, parables, three stories that Jesus tells. And it hits home because it it tells a story that, that we can relate to, either as a child or as a parent. And it captures the attention of the crowd. It tells, basically, of, of a parent who has two sons. The younger of the two sons one day comes to the father and says, Dad, I, I think I have... I think I have squeezed everything out of this relationship that I can. There's really nothing else here for me except one thing, and that would be my inheritance. Uh, the money that would be rightfully due me when you die uh, is the only thing left here for me, and I would like it now. And the father gives it to him. The son, very soon after, leaves the family and squanders the wealth. This story is the longest of the three, but it still reads very briefly, just, just a dozen verses or so. It reads very quickly, but, but the request from the son and the response from the father throughout this story, they are significant, they are profound, and we would do well to, to become very familiar with this story, not just from the prodigal son's perspective, but from the father's and perhaps also from, from the other son, the, the brother of the prodigal. The request from the son, give me my inheritance now. There's nothing left here for me. I want the only thing left, and I don't want to wait for it. I'll take it today. What's even more amazing is is the father hears the request and grants it. And I think we learn something as Jesus is telling this parable that relates to us. Now, it, it's talking about a parent-child relationship, but Jesus is really talking about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And in the parable, Jesus teaches us that at the very beginning, the father did something remarkable, and that was yield to the request of the son. The father yielded or, or acquiesced, ass, ass, looked at, assessed the situation, heard the request, played out in his mind very quickly. What is he really asking for? There are two sons, we know from Jewish history, that the oldest of the two sons would get a double portion, and then the younger kids, in this case, just one would get the rest. So, 
what the son is asking his father for is one third of all of his wealth. Parents, put yourself in that spot for a second. You finish up a lovely morning worshiping with your family here at church. You go home, you have some lunch, and one of your younger children, when lunch is over, says, Dad, I've been thinking. Uh, I think I'm ready to, to strike out in the world on my own. I'd like to go. I know that someday down the road, uh, you and Mom will both be gone, and, and me and my siblings will split up whatever is left. Um, I, I'd like my portion today. In this story, with two sons, what the son is really asking for is one-third of all the father's accumulated wealth today. He asks for a third of everything he's worked for. Um, I, I have to admit that uh, it was not long ago, within the last couple of weeks, uh, I made dinner one evening for my family. It wasn't fancy, but it was something... Uh, just simple, and, and I didn't get the gratitude from Grant about dinner that I thought I deserved. And, and I lost my mind a little bit. It, it, was, it was a small offense. He didn't want that. He wanted something else. And, and he, you know, voiced his opinion about it. Okay. Uh, that small uh, level two offense, I, I came unglued. I, I responded at about a seven or eight. Uh, there, there was no physical altercation, but, but I lost my mind a little bit. So dumb. This kid asked for a third of his father's wealth, and the father said, okay. Uh, that's an incredible response. The father yielding to what amounts to way more than just a foolish request. I mean, it is the most disrespectful request that the, the son could have asked for. Dad, there is nothing here for me. You have nothing left that I want except, except a third, my third of everything you own. There was a man who had two sons, verses 11 and 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Parents, I, I know many of you, like myself, have at some point felt rejected by your kids. I don't want cheeseburgers for dinner. Right? Right? We feel rejection from our kids all the time. Sometimes, sometimes it's something simple. They've rejected the instructions we give them. You tell your four-year-old daughter to stay out of mommy's makeup. And they reject your instructions. And they make a mess of, of your bathroom. And they use up your favorite whatever that stuff is that you, that you use. <laughs> That's rejection. It's to a small degree, but it's a, it's a direct rejection of your instructions to them. Some of you have felt rejection, maybe when your kids get a little bit older, and, and you take them to, to a, a local event, and as soon as you walk in the door or the gates, they see a bunch of their friends, their 9, 10, 11-year-old friends, and all of a sudden, a lovely family evening turns into you sitting in the auditorium by yourself while they go run around with all their friends, because now their friends, their friends mean more to them in that moment. They would rather spend time with their friends, and, and you get ditched, right? You, you feel a little bit of social rejection in those moments, moms and dads. Or when they get a little bit older yet, and they date the hoodlum down the road that it doesn't come from the right upbringing or family, and you know that you don't want your little girl going into town with that boy, and you feel a little bit of rejection there, or they get that tattoo, or go to that college, or marry that person. Each of us has been created with, with our own will, 
And as our kids grow up, they exercise that will more and more. And parents, we feel rejection, sometimes little, sometimes big. And it hurts. And, and we find ourselves in these moments, do I yield to the request? Is this, how important is this? Do I give in or do I stand my ground? Do I force the issue? Do I die on this hill with, with my child? And, and it takes time for us to develop that will. And so we're trying to assess all those things. And parenthood all of a sudden gets super complicated because now that she's covered in mom's makeup and it doesn't look good and there's a mess in the bathroom, all of a sudden we start playing out. Well, if she's going to disobey me on this, then maybe she won't listen to me when I tell her that. And, and we play this thing out 20 years and we've got her homeless, living on the streets, addicted to drugs because she has lipstick on her face. It's so crazy. And yet each of us does it at some point. And so we're trying to navigate and engage all of these things. The tensions of, of expecting and requiring obedience as a parent with allowing freedom so that our, our children can make choices on their own and recognize that those choices will play out and have consequences. And, and we want them to learn about consequences and sometimes to face those natural consequences but in the moment we're trying to gauge how how disastrous will this be and sometimes our our minds and emotions get a little carried away as, as moms and dads so not only takes them time to develop their ability to make these choices but it takes us time and to develop the ability to a allow it and so we're kind of working through this, trying to be a wise and discerning and loving parent. And this, this is the challenge. Last week, I shared that, that when he was six years old, Grant decided to go live on his own, right? In the neighborhood where we lived, that, it was fine. Sarah did a beautiful job navigating that. If we lived in downtown LA, maybe, maybe we don't play it out the same way. Uh, in that situation. And, and you have to navigate all of those things. We allow our children to, to have boyfriends and girlfriends whenever they first have the urge, or at age 12, or age 16, or 18, or 30. Like, when, when, does, when is the right time to do that? When should we allow them to have their own cell phone? Choosing colleges and careers. All of these things. We, we play this in our heads as parents we use discernment when they're young because it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy. But as they grow, we, we lean more and more into just praying like crazy all the time. We could start with that earlier. We should be starting with that from the beginning, but, but we feel like we have it under control until we don't, and then we tend to end up on our knees. And it's, and it's about the stakes that are, that are in play with our kids, isn't it? So how do we respond? Well, Jesus tells this story about a father, a loving father, whose son asks a ridiculous request, and the father grants it. I think, well, maybe this is just one place, but then, then I remember this story from Matthew 19 that Mark actually repeats as well, and and we find it in Mark chapter 10 about a wealthy young man. And this isn't a story. This isn't just a, a made-up parable to tell a point. This actually happened as Jesus was teaching. A, a wealthy young man came to Jesus and began inquiring from Christ what it would mean to, to follow him. Mark 10 says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. So this is Jesus on the move, and this guy literally runs Jesus down and throws himself at Jesus' feet in humble submission before Jesus. Good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He is asking the question that we hope every person at some point comes to ask, right? What must I do? To inherit eternal life. This is fruit ripe for the picking for those of you who have friends and neighbors that don't, don't know Christ, don't have a relationship with Him. We would kill for this opportunity. 
And Jesus turns to him and says, what? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. And then he says to the man, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. And then Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at the young man and felt this welling up inside of him. Love for the man. And he says to him, there is, there is one thing. There's one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. You see, this man comes running to Jesus. He, he desires eternal life. He, he has this, this appetite, a desire deep within him to live in eternity in the presence of his creator. What must I do to get there, he says. And Jesus looks at the young man he hears the request, and then he pushes, pushes against his desires a little bit. He tests to see just how, how much do you really desire this. He, he noticed that the man had referred to him as good, and so he pushes on that. Do you, you called me good. If no one is good except God himself... Are, are you acknowledging, are you admitting that you truly believe that I am in fact God? Jesus is asking him. And then he says, you, you know the commands, you know what God has instructed you, but you notice when he starts listing the commands, he starts in the middle. He skips over the one catch that he knows this young man has. Have no other gods before me. He does all of the behaviors with his peers, and he asks, he inquires about this, and the young man says, I've done all of those things, that everything, everything I have kept that, that you've mentioned here. And then Jesus calls him out on the one thing. You, you, you find more security and stability and joy in your wealth than you truly do with God. Give up all of that for a relationship with me, who you, you have claimed to be good, and we all know that 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 is only that is only a title that we can truly give to God. So he challenges the man's full submission and his desire to God's authority, and then maybe one of the saddest passages in in all of Scripture: the man went away sad. I I, I can't do that. That, that's a non-negotiable for me. Lord, you, you can't have that. What's amazing to me, Jesus let him walk away. Jesus didn't run him down. Jesus didn't chase him. Jesus didn't say, wait, 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 wait. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Let me explain to you why you, you really don't need those things. I mean, they're temporary. Jesus doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to explain it. He, he doesn't try to make a defense for what he's asked of the man. He doesn't do any of that to soften the blow or to ask him to come back or to, to outline, if you go through with this, these are the consequences. These are the eternal consequences of this choice. Don't walk away. Jesus doesn't do any of that. The man went away sad. And the next response from Jesus is Jesus turning to his disciples to teach from it and say, you see? See, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for some people, wealthy people in particular, to, to turn that over. God allows us to hang on to, to, to hold on to that which we most value. He doesn't pry it out of our, our hands. We all have a will, and he allows us to, to play out our will and to, 
to experience the consequences, the natural outcomes from those things. The son had requested his inheritance. Inheritance, again, an inheritance is what you receive at the end of your parents' involvement in your life, right? When they, when they die, there is no more counsel that you're receiving from them. There's no more assistance or help or provision or rescue. They're done, and you get what's left. And the son is saying, I don't need or desire anything from you, Father, going forward. I'll just, I'll just take the money that eventually will be mine anyway. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. The Bible tells us he was so hungry, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pig, pigs were eating, but no one, no one gave him anything. He found himself desperate. There's no, no place in this section of Scripture, in the story, in the parable, where Jesus says, and the father heard of the son's <coughs> great struggle and went and found him. The, the father didn't go rescue him. The father avoided jumping in and rescuing the son from those natural consequences. This, this week... Um, I had just a, an incredible conversation with two good friends, both in ministry. One of them I, I consider a mentor, uh, and we had scheduled the, this weekly meeting together to talk. And uh, one of, actually both of those guys are just kind of working through some things in life that are a little difficult right now. But one of them in particular is dealing with something with, with his own child, and she's at that age where she's now making decisions for herself. And uh, she's, she's not necessarily asking for mom and dad's permission on those things. She's just kind of navigating life. And, and she's made a, a one decision in particular that, that are, it's causing great stress and anxiety for, for this friend of mine and his wife. And then we were talking about parents and, and feeling this, this incredible weight of responsibility as your kids kind of leave the house and now they're making these choices that really do set a course in life for them partners and careers and all these things and and they they feel the stress of that and and, and as we talked through this you could just feel the the anxiety the the heartache uh the worry and concern for his daughter and as we kind of talk through some of these things, uh, this, this other pastor said to him, as a parent, when our kids are, are making those types of choices and they're at that stage in life, as a parent, it's okay for us to embrace the pain of some of their decisions, but it's not okay for us to continue carrying the pressure of their choices. And that it, it, it struck me so deeply. Let me say it again. As a parent, as our children go out from our house and they begin to make life choices, they make those decisions, those decisions, we will feel something, right? Some of those decisions, when we know that they're, they're not probably best, when we know, we know they may bring unpleasant consequences. It's okay for us to feel heartache and pain for our kids, but not okay for us to steal away and steal back the responsibility for those decisions. And so often we do exactly the opposite of that. I know I do. 
So often as our kids are now becoming adults and making adult decisions and kind of striking out of the world, so often I do the exact opposite. I, I feel this, this weight and this responsibility and I, I feel this pressure, this continued pressure that I've carried for a lot of years. I feel this pressure of making sure that my kids' choices are always right and always best and I will do anything I can within my power to avoid any pain as a result of their choices. Parents, we, we have to set down the pressure as our parents grow, or as our kids grow and, and move on, as they begin to make their own choices. Parents, we, we have to allow them to carry that responsibility. We must release the pressure we feel but we also must understand that in that season, we might still feel pain from those decisions. We might see what's coming down the road and, and feel concern for them. Paul gives similar instructions to the Corinthian church when dealing with some horrible sin that's happening in that congregation. This individual that's engaged in an egregious sexual sin within his family, Paul says, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. That's a difficult thing to do. To say, we, we see the decisions you're making, we're going to allow you to do that, but we're, we're not protecting you anymore. We're, we're not going to engage in and removing the natural consequences that will come from your actions. And Paul says, sometimes only in the destruction of the flesh, of the flesh do, we, do we come back and sense the need for, for real spiritual renewal. Parents, painful con consequences teach lessons that your children may never hear from your lips. They may not be able to hear them from your mouth and they may have to experience them. And it will cause pain for you to watch it play out. But that heartache, that heartache that you feel for them, and the heartache that certainly they will feel as, as their actions play themselves out, it gives birth to something else. It gives birth to something beautiful on the backside of the pain. You see, the story tells us that the son grew so desperate, so hungry, living on the streets, eating whatever he could steal from the pigs. No one giving him anything. No one seeing his situation and having any sort of, of mercy on him. It was only in that moment when he realized he would die of starvation that he thought, I could go back to my father and I could at least be a slave there. He, he probably won't receive me back as a son. I've already taken my inheritance. There's nothing, there is nothing there for me, but maybe I could, I could live on his farm. Luke 15, 20, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You see what was birthed out of the father allowing the son to live his life and experience those consequences. What was birthed in the father's pain and the son's pain was a readiness and a willingness for reconciliation, for the son to swallow his pride and to return even on different terms, and for the father to receive him back. It was the father's compassion for the son, identified in verse 20. He was filled with that compassion out of all the pain, out of all the heartache, out of all the concern and the worry that he had felt for his son, out of the, the brokenheartedness of not seeing and hearing from his son for however long it was. The rejection that he had experienced when his son said, I want nothing from you except, except the money. The father's compassion left him ready to reconcile at the son's repentance. 
He saw him while he was a long way off. How many days do you think the father looked for the son on the horizon? Waiting for his return. That he might celebrate his return. That he might celebrate the reunion of that that relationship. And the order is important. The repentance has to happen first before any reconciliation or reunion can happen. If we try to force the latter two before the first has happened, it will fall apart again. And yet it's so difficult. You see, parents, moms, dads, your lack of interference doesn't mean that you, you don't love your child. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. There is another son in the story. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Parents, most people won't understand your willingness to forgive your child. Certainly the neighbors won't. Maybe your other children won't. The older son failed to appreciate the relationship between his brother and his parent because he he never really appreciated his own relationship with his father. You see, it was focused on on what he was going to get as well. He may have he may not have run off to a distant country, he may not have squandered his wealth <coughs> like his brother, but he was still focused on on what he was receiving from the father financially. He stayed, he played by the rules, did the things he was supposed to. But when the relationship was restored, there was no joy in it for the older brother. Some of you have played by the rules and you've worked for your father, waiting for your reward, but never really enjoyed the fullness of the relationship available to you. We, we, all, we all have been rescued. We all have been invited into relationship with the one who created us and loves us. And some of, some of us reject him so boldly and run away so hard. Others do so much more subtly. And we reject the relationship for the benefits and the perks of staying on the farm but we don't invest. We don't invest in, in the relationship itself. Today we are going to finish with a, a time of prayer for us to consider where, where do I stand with the Father? How do I reflect His great love and compassion, His incredible patience and desire for for me? How do I reflect his willingness to forgive and restore relationship after my rebellion and my rejection? How do I reflect all of that in the way that I, I raise my children and care for my children and receive my children when they recognize the error of their ways? And then we're going to sing a song that we all love about just how earth-shattering that type of love is for a child. Let's pray. Father, some of us have been in distant lands, estranged from you and far from you for, for far too long. We know that life with you is far better, would be far better, and for whatever reason, we have not desired it. We have we have clung to and held on to that which is less. 
Others of us have stayed close but grown so distant from you. Many of us have rejected you very, very subtly, putting on an air of being completely, completely devoted to you like the rich young ruler. Perhaps we've not lied and cheated and stolen. But Lord, we've made other gods. We found security in other sources. We've held back from you in different ways. Jesus, you told us, <laughs> told us three stories back to back that we might know just how much celebration happens in heaven when we turn our hearts back to you. And so, Father, this morning, whether we have been far off in obvious ways or subtle ones, God, we recognize our great need, not for what you offer, but but for you, just you, you alone. You are sovereign and holy. You are powerful and good. And you have gone to hell itself to rescue us from ourselves. And Father, this morning we worship you for it. You shake the very foundations of creation and of our souls that we might see you and respond to you. And so this morning we give you ourselves fully. We repent of our sin. Ask for your forgiveness. We come running to you and you alone. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Do it. 
the pro 